This is really the beginning of Christian charity. The, the Christians had such a bond of unity that they shared everything in common so that no one had any need. Um, so if there was a poor person, they were looked after. Um, but as we go on in the book of Acts, so still in the year 30, the very, very beginning of Christianity, in Acts chapter 6, we find that this practice of sharing goods and looking after the poor becomes such a big affair that they have to appoint um, seven officials to look after the aid program uh, because there's now a dispute between the Greek-speaking uh, widows, poor people, and the Aramaic-speaking poor people and hard to look after all the groups, so they appoint seven people. So already in the earliest stage of Christianity, um, caring for those in need is at the very heart. There wasn't much charity in the Greco-Roman world uh, amongst pagans. There were some uh, moments when the emperors practiced benefaction. They opened the grain silos to please people. But beyond that, there wasn't much. But, but where there was charity is in the Jewish communities, uh, not only in Israel itself, but out in the Jewish community of Rome and in Alexandria. Jews were famous for looking after the poor within their community. Now, of course, because Christianity emerged from Judaism, all of the first Christians were Jews. They just inherited this practice of making sure you're always feeding the poor, that this is a, a, a key part of what it means to, to practice faith in the one God of Israel, who's revealed himself now in, uh, in the Messiah. So it's basically a Jewish practice, which Christians inherit. But then what happens is the Christians expand the program so that charity is not just for Jews anymore. The scale of the Christian poverty programs could be quite large, actually. We, we know that in the uh, year 250 in Rome, so this is still well before Christianity is the dominant faith, well before uh, they had any imperial support. So the year 250 in Rome, the, the Church of Rome was supporting 1,500 poverty-stricken people each day on a daily food roster. Now, that makes it the largest uh, social club in ancient Rome, bigger than the Baker's Union, the Metal Workers Union and so on. But this is just the poor who were being fed uh, by, by the church. Um, but then you could go to a little town like Kerta in uh, North Africa. And we have some very interesting evidence that comes from the Great Persecution. So it's the early 300s, still before Christianity is a, an officially recognized faith. The little church of Kerta was raided during the persecutions because uh, the Romans thought they would find treasures down below, just like you do in a pagan temple, treasures down below. And they found treasures, but you know what they found? They found a room stocked uh, full of goods for the poor. They'd found the poverty room. Um, and and there's, we actually have the court records that list um, 18 pairs of male shoes, 85 pairs of women's shoes, um, you know, 13 dresses, 10 vats of oil and wine for the poor. They had found the treasure of the church, but what they'd actually discovered was that the church's gift of care for those in need. There was very little they could do outside of their church communities because they were mainly an oppressed people. But we have excellent evidence that as soon as Christianity had some freedoms, so early 5th century now, they did start to pull off what we would call social justice programs. And we have this fantastic letter uh, from St. Augustine, the, the great uh, bishop of North Africa, in which he's writing to a fellow church leader in the year 428. And he's just in passing mentions the regular slave rescue programs his church uh, enacts. So slave traders would come into port the Christians would hear about it, and they would secretly go and break free these slaves, bring them secretly to their homes, uh, clothe and feed them, and then try and get them out uh, of, of the region, away from the slave traders. It's beautiful evidence that very early on, Christians were trying to do good in the broader society to bring justice into society. The Romans watched what the Christians were doing, at first puzzled, then they persecuted, then they got really worried at what the Christians were doing, partly because the Christians were preaching a message about another kingdom. That's a big no-no, because we know what kingdom you're meant to be supporting. But also because of the incredible uh, scope and scale of the Christian poverty programs and social justice programs. It got to the point where Roman emperors were worried 
that the Christians were going to take over the Roman world by the stealth of their good deeds. And we have this fabulous uh, set of letters from the pagan emperor Julian in the 4th century in which he starts to write to the pagan priests throughout um, Galatia or what we would call Turkey insisting that they institute in pagan temples a social welfare program modelled on the Christian welfare program. And he's explicit that we need to beat the Christians at their own game. We have one letter where he actually donates uh, the equivalent of millions of dollars from the imperial bank account to set up a poverty program uh, in the pagan temples of Galatia to beat the Christians. And toward the end of the letter, he says, it is disgraceful that these Christians care not only for their own poor, but ours as well. And he's like outraged that Christianity is spreading throughout the world because it just loves people. Whether they're believers or not believers, they care for them and meet their needs. Spiritually, yes, but also materially. It seems that the Christians were motivated in their social justice and poverty programs by at least three ideas. One was a, a different vision of the human being. So Christians inherited the Jewish idea that human beings are made in the image of God, that they are therefore inherently valuable. doesn't matter whether they are rich or poor, they are inherently valuable in the, in the image of God. The second idea is a, is a different view of God. And that is God actually is loving. To a Greco-Roman uh, adherent in the ancient world, it would have puzzled them to hear that, that God actually cared for, felt compassion for creatures. The gods of Greece and Rome could be loving, but they were very often capricious. One day in a good mood, the next day in a bad mood. But the Christian view of God was he actually really loved people. And that motivated a care for others. And I think the third idea that you can, you can detect in these early Christian texts has to do with the Christians believing that the kingdom of God was coming. This goes right back to Jesus, but we can see it in the first, second and third centuries. They believed that a kingdom was coming into the world that would um, bring justice, that would bring the relief of the poor, that would bring the end of suffering. And the Christians said, OK, that kingdom's coming. Let's live like it's here already. Let's anticipate the kingdom by living lives of justice and care and, uh, and, and relieving the poor. You can see a very clear tie between the Christian view that the kingdom of God is coming and we should act like it's here already, and Jesus' own ministry. One of the very striking things about the Gospels is not only that Jesus preached the kingdom of God is near, according to the Gospels, he um, gave demonstrations of the values of the kingdom in the present. One example would be his whining and dining with the sinners of his day. Uh, this was not just because he was a social liberal or anything like that. Um, uh, Jesus is very hard to box in, but it was because Jesus knew the kingdom of God was about the redemption of the sinner. So we should act now as if the sinner is redeemed. Sit down at the table with those classed the outsiders. But the other is his own uh, reported miracle working. Now whatever you make of the miracles, one thing is quite clear from the Gospels. People saw them, in fact Jesus saw them himself, as signs of the future kingdom. Why? Because the future kingdom was about restoring justice, overthrowing evil, uh, meeting people's real needs. And the healings seem to have been these little signs in history of what God was going to do at the end of history. And that is the logic of the Christian faith. Let's live like the kingdom's already here. Justice is coming. Let's practice justice. The overthrow of poverty is coming. Let's try and do that too. Uh, it's a wonderful anticipation of God's kingdom coming to earth.